In an unprecedented move this evening, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature has announced that there is no longer just one giraffe. I mean, what's next? Five elephants? We are talking about the future of a beautiful species here. They deserve to have region specific treatment. The question now on everyone's minds is why? This right here is a giraffe. Can we talk about the giraffe for a second? I am dying to talk about the giraffe. You see, the giraffe used to be the giraffe, but now the one giraffe is four giraffes. New species of the same animal divided up over and over. Why do we need new giraffes? We already had giraffe at home. It was one species and it was called the giraffe. And that's before you got the subspecies involved. I am begging you not to get the subspecies involved. Okay, I'll get the subspecies involved. There are nine subspecies of giraffe already. Why do we need to take one species and nine subspecies of giraffe and turn them into four species and who knows how many subspecies? It's eight. It's eight subspecies. Why do we need to change all of this? What, just because the way that we organize animals and have always organized animals is genuinely insane? I mean, <laughs> yeah, sure. It's never made any sense at all, but it's what we taught to kids in schools for some reason and now they're changing that whole thing the way that we know how to classify animals is all different and now so many animals are left with names that make it seem like they're related to each other even though they're not and so many animals were named before we understood evolution or genetics enough to know that they're actually not related at all they just kind of look the same and so many people think bugs aren't animals dude and i and i heard someone say once that a dolphin isn't an animal because it has blue blood what? Dolphins don't have blue blood. And it doesn't matter anyway. Horseshoe crabs have blue blood and they're still animals. We're... <laughs> we're gonna need to figure this all out together. But to understand why we're even talking about giraffes, we're gonna need to go right to the top. Okay, so we all know what a species is. It's one of these things, right? The fancy scientific names that tell us that this is one animal, and the ones with other names are different animals. These aren't just limited to animals, of course, but animals are the part of nature that I'm most interested in, so that's what I'm going to talk about. We use species as a measurement to understand how life diversifies, interacts, and adapts to the world around it. This is the scientific name of the giraffe, and how this works is that the first word is the genus, one level above species, and the second word is the species itself. If there is a third word, that's a subspecies, and that's used to show that there are some very small different groups within this species. Don't worry, we can make all this a lot clearer. Panthera. This is a genus, one step above species. Panthera is also known as the panthers, or the big cats. Within the genus of Panthera, there are five species. Leo, Tigris, Pardus, Unsa, and Uncia. Want to guess what these are better known as? Yeah, I mean, Panthera, Leo is a lion. Panthera tigris is a tiger. If you're familiar at all with Portuguese, you might know that Panthera Unsa is the jaguar. The other two are the leopard and the snow leopard. Here we have the five species of big cat. Hypothetically, if any of these species were born with melanism, which is the opposite of albinism or being albino, we would call them a black panther. But this really only occurs in leopards and jaguars. A black panther isn't a species of its own. If we look at the tiger, there are a few subspecies like Bengal tiger or Sumatran tiger. And this is where we would add that third word to the end, where we're trying to specify what type of tiger. That's how scientific names work. But there's a problem. We've been naming animals for a very, very long time. We have a lot of names that aren't scientific and often aren't even talking about animals that are actually related, but they use the same names anyway. Maybe you're looking at this list of big cats and you're thinking that some are missing. Maybe you're thinking that the puma or mountain lion, that's a big cat. Maybe you're thinking cheetah, that's a big cat too. Historically, we have called these cats big cats, but they aren't in the panther genus. Puma is its own genus, a part of a wider group of cats we call small cats, because it's more closely related to smaller wild cats than they are to big cats. If you take a look at its face, you'll see a stronger relationship to your house cat in the puma 
than you will see in a house cat and let's say a jaguar. The same goes for cheetah. They are asynonics. Puma is one of its closest relatives. Both of these cats, despite being big, are classified as small cats. They purr in the same way that your house cat does. They scream, they growl, they hiss, but they do not roar like a panther. As far as cats go, these aren't very related to the panthers. Big cats is just one example of a word or phrase that we now realize is a mix of animals that aren't super related to each other. Weasels is another one. Any stoats, ferrets, minks, and polecats are all weasels, meaning that they're from the genus Mustela, unless it's one of these five, which are Neogale. Toads are just a bunch of different unrelated frogs. They aren't a different animal from frogs or even one group. We just decided to call the ugly frogs toads. And honestly, it's kind of bullying. Vultures, sharks, bats, and don't get me started on crabs. Let's definitely not bring up the ongoing arguments about what is a fish and what is a tree. We don't have time for that right now. Another big one, though, is antelope. When you picture an antelope in your head, you're probably thinking of a four-legged herbivore with horns living in a hot grassland or desert. In reality, what we call antelope are 91 different species across 30 different genera. They are not one group of animals. In fact, their historic definition has boiled down to any cloven-hoofed grass-grazing mammal that isn't a cow, bison, buffalo, sheep, or goat. Real specific, guys. Good work. <laughs> not the most scientific way to define an animal. But it gets worse, because the pronghorn is an antelope. Want to guess what the closest living relative of the pronghorn is? Giraffes. For a few hundred years, we've tried to organize these animals by grouping them based on their appearance. And now we're starting to understand a few more things about the natural world. And our old way of sorting animals doesn't make any sense. Here's why. Dear King Philip came over for good soup. That's one of the mnem, 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 mnemonic phrases that get stranger and stranger used to help remember this chart. This is how we categorize animals. The only problem is, once you go above genus, you can kind of throw it all out. This method of categorizing animals means that every animal has the same number of layers and how they are related to each other. It was invented in 1735 by Carl Linnaeus, and it represents the thinking at the time. Now, he wasn't around for most of the understanding we have of evolution and genetics, so he's missed out on a lot. He originally categorized everything on Earth as either a plant, animal, or mineral, which ignores the vast majority of living things, which are microorganisms so small we can't see them, and it also lumped in fungi with plants, which they aren't. Fungi are actually more closely related to you, than they are to plants. Wild concept, isn't it? <laughs> but let's break it down, because it will make sense in a minute. Plants get their food from sunlight and water through photosynthesis, and animals get their food from consuming organic matter, whether it's plants or other animals. Fungi also eat organic matter. You'll see mushrooms growing on tree trunks or mold on a bread loaf, eating other organic life forms or their byproducts. The most recent common ancestor between animals and fungus is estimated to be more than a billion years ago, but that's still more recent than the common ancestor that either of those groups has with plants. This chart that we've now got in front of us is called a phylogenetic tree. It's about understanding life on Earth based on what it evolved from and where it splits from a common ancestor between two groups of animals. We can understand this by looking at the genetic code and the DNA of living things. We all know what an animal is, and we all know what a plant is, we all know what a fungus is, right? We can tell the difference between those things. Giraffes, they're animals. Bamboo, that's a type of plant. Portobello, that's a fungus. So what's coral? You know, the thing that lives on a reef. Let's look at the definitions. You might have learned about different types of cells in high school. You know, the classic mitochondria is the powerhouse of some cells actually most cells in your body are red blood cells and those don't have mitochondria but that's a different topic you may remember that there are different shapes for animal cells fungal cells and plant cells this is the defining difference between these groups they are all about the tangible visible differences in how organisms function at the microscopic level 
the cheat sheet here, just to make it really easy for you, is that plants have cell walls made of polysaccharides, such as cellulose. Fungi have cell walls made of chitin, but coral, coral don't have cell walls at all. This makes them animals. And I think, I think deep down you knew that in your heart all along. So next time you see someone carving their initials in a heart into the side of coral, remember those are not plants. You are carving into the side of animals while they're still alive. We've always had rules like this that define the difference between living things, and these rules for what counts as what have existed at every level of classification, not just at the top. It's just that now we're having to change them. These are fine to have tangible evidence-based definitions at the top, but it's when you get further down the ladder that we've struggled, this kind of middle section. This is where we're coming up with definitions like the one we have for antelope, where it's based on they look similar. We used to define a species as being a population that can breed together, and then those children can also breed, therefore maintaining their population. Hybrids do exist, of course, like the very famous liger, which is a male lion and a female tiger having a child together, but ligers are infertile, they can't have children of their own. This means that even though tigers and lions can breed, their children can't, so they can't maintain a population together, and because of that, lions and tigers are different species. But then we have ducks. The mallard is a species of duck that has run rampant throughout the world, successfully breeding with all kinds of ducks that are supposedly different species, including grey ducks here in New Zealand that are now going extinct because they're being replaced by grey duck mallard hybrids. So we've realized that this definition of what makes a species doesn't work as well as we thought it did. We were kind of stuck trying to find a better way to understand the relationships between different animals for a very long time. There were theories, but they were somewhat lacking for one reason or another. That is, until we began to understand evolution, natural selection, and genetic code. Now we have a relationship that we can define. Because genes that are stored in the mitochondria of a cell are fairly immune to being mixed, we can look at the genetic makeup and the code that goes into making an animal alive to understand how these particular sequences have been inherited. These genes get passed down for countless generations before they get too mixed up to be traced, so we can see what they have in common with each other. With enough DNA sequenced among animals and animals we believe to be similarly related, we can identify which of these genes are new to this particular animal and which have been inherited from a common ancestor. This information can tell us which animals share a common ancestor with each other at all, and we can even estimate how long ago this ancestor lived and plot them out to understand the actual relationships between animals in a much larger scale of building a family tree. It's this new system that we have of understanding our natural world that's led to researchers revisiting some of the animals we thought we already knew about, like the giraffe. The question is, what is actually the difference between these giraffes, and why are we looking into it? The genes of the nine subspecies of giraffe revealed something to researchers. These subspecies are not nine similar giraffes, they're more like four groups of similar giraffes. This means that the most common recent ancestor for two and two is more recent than the most recent common ancestor for all giraffes. So instead of nine subspecies in one species, which would mean the relationship in most recent common ancestor would look like this, we now have eight subspecies divided into four species. This is the reason why there are more species now. But the genetic code of an animal doesn't matter when you're on a safari looking at them, so what actually makes these giraffes different at a more visible level? Well, two of the genetically distinct subspecies have become the southern giraffe. These are probably exactly what you imagine when you hear the word giraffe. Just classic, no notes, it says what it is on the packet type of giraffe. Four more subspecies became the northern giraffe with two of those subspecies being nearly genetically identical, so they're combining into one. Northern giraffes are a little harder to spot because they look very similar to the southern giraffe, but their ossicones, which are the pointy bones that look like horns, are bigger, and they actually have a distinctive extra ossicone in the middle of their forehead. The reticulated giraffe is a subspecies being elevated straight to species level on its own. 
you can tell it apart because it's more spot than not. It's less like a white animal with orange spots and more like an orange animal with a white spider web drawn on it. The last of them is the Maasai giraffe. This is the largest of them and it looks like someone got a paintbrush and then kind of pu pushed it straight down, giving it these darker, more splatter looking spots. To be able to separate these animals like this based on their genetic code, we need to be able to get the entire genetic code from multiple individuals in multiple populations and take the time to review it all. So it's not exactly an easy thing to be able to do, especially for every animal, but it does represent a shift in the way that we talk about animals. This may all seem trivial and feel like unnecessary bureaucracy to argue whether there is one giraffe or four giraffes, but when you're living in Ethiopia, Cameroon, Mali, or even Egypt, where giraffes are either going or are already extinct, and you're trying to convince people that you need to put together resources to save the giraffe, there's a good chance they'll turn around and tell you that actually, the giraffe is officially listed as only vulnerable, they're not even considered endangered. But if you can stand up and say that there are only around 6,000 northern giraffe left in the world, and they used to exist across most of North Africa, but currently the resources for the giraffe most often goes to the heavily touristed areas where the southern giraffe lives with a population of over 40,000. You have a case to say that this animal needs resources so we can take action to restore the population. And not only that, but the right resources and the right actions that will restore these specific populations. Look, it's not the only reason or even the main reason for the study or official species split, but it is somewhere that we can use this information to have a real positive impact. The Senegalese giraffe, one of the subspecies of northern giraffe not mentioned on this list or in any of the news around the new giraffe classifications, went extinct in the 1970s. Knowing more specifically which populations are at risk and what they specifically require to come back from the brink can be the difference between more animals like the Senegalese giraffe becoming extinct and having these animals sticking around so that people born in Ethiopia and Cameroon today won't have to tell their grandchildren that there used to be giraffes. Hopefully this species split is the last time we'll have to talk about what giraffes used to be. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ben the Quasi-Ecologist. This is The Natural World, and until next time, stay curious, friends. The cheat sheet here is that plants have cell walls made of polysaccharides. It's made of polysaccharides, such as cellulose. Fungus have cell walls between living things, and these rules for what counts as